Hello, hello. I'd like to welcome you to this pre-recorded webinar for introducing you to Thought Technologies EEG system. We decided to make this recording available because we had some users who were getting going with our technology for the first time, and they seemed to need a little bit more of a help up or help to get started. And so here we are. Uh, over the next hour and a bit, I'm going to be going over equipment hookup, uh, initiating a software for an assessment, as well as initiating a neurofeedback training session. I'll be going over the basics of everything and giving you just enough knowledge so you can really get started. It's not meant to be a complete replacement for the software manual that we provide or additional clinical education, but it's a great way of getting going immediately. We've designed this recording to be really useful for those who are already embarking on a BCIA um, mentorship or training workshop. And so this will complement the clinical learning by providing you with technical knowledge about how to use our product. We are not going to be going into any clinical learning in this recording. For those of you who don't know, my name is John Bale. I've presented a lot of webinars and recordings for Thought Technology, as well as instructed a lot of individuals in private or group settings, and so I'm happy to do this with you all right now. You're not going to be seeing me the whole time in this little web camera box, so for now I'm going to disappear, but I'll be coming back later when we need to use my head as a little bit of a, a guinea pig for applying some electrodes. So for those of you who perhaps are not familiar with thought technology, we've been in the field of psychophysiology, biometric and biofeedback for at least 45 years. Uh, back in the late 60s, early 70s, when applied psychophysiology was getting going, we were there at the beginning and our founder, um, Hal Myers, was there initially figuring out how to uh, start, how to use a galvanic skin response or skin conductance. And uh, from there, we'd have started developing many other products that measure a whole lot of different other biometrics. And here we are today uh, in year 2000 something, uh, doing neural feedback. <laughs> um, we are a medical manufacturer who produces high quality products. Again, we've been around since the beginning of the field, so we definitely have outlasted a lot of other people out there. Um, in general, our products tend to work so well that we have a lot of people who bought them 20, 30, 40 years ago, and they still use them and still come back to us uh, to buy more products or perhaps just get a little uh, bit of an addition to what they're already using. Now, we are a global company. We have dealers and representatives, I believe, in at least 50 countries that serve about 100 countries total. And so I might be at our headquarters in North America. However, there are a lot of us in different locations. We've worked with a lot of different people. And here's some uh, arbitrary, really, from my perspective, names that people seem to recognize more. NASA, Ferrari, Marines, uh, Olympic committees, and sport leagues. We are very well known for our uh, peak performance or athletics programs. But that doesn't say we're not a lot of other things too. We're in countless hospital networks, uh, helping people not with performance issues, but of normal, real medical issues. And we're in countless local clinics. Chances are you yourself, who is listening to the recording, are wanting to provide this in your private clinic. And so that's more applicable to you. Now, in terms of the number of products Thought Technology has for neural feedback, we tend to have three general systems. We call them the Starter, Intermediate, Expert System. I'm actually going to be describing the equipment hookup for all three. It's not that different. But just know that regardless of which one you have, this recording is appropriate for you. Most of you who are getting started in neural feedback will in fact have the Starter System, which is a little white Procom 2 box. You can record data from up to two sensors at the same time. But others of you may have the Intermediate or the Expert, which uses the Procom 5 or the Procom Infinity blocks, which records data from up to five sensors or from up to eight sensors. Um, for the basis of this learning, I am going to be focusing on Thought Technologies 360 Suite. It is our standard software package that we hand out to users getting started in this technology. It allows you to record neural feedback, and if you have other sensors, such as heart variability, breathing, uh, muscles, skin touch, and temperature, as well as passive infrared, uh, we allow that measurement as well. I'm only going to be focusing on the EEG aspects because that's the goal of this recording, but just know that our, our packages offer full psychophysiological assessments and training, and you can look at a variety of modalities depending on what you're interested in. For us, though, focusing on, focusing on that central nervous system using EEG measurements. Now, all of you already should already have uh, the software installed on your computer, in which case you'll notice on your desktop you have two icons. The primary one is called Biograph Infinity, that's a little blue icon, and then you have a secondary yellow Biograph Infinity Docs and Editors icon. I like to point out this yellow one because people tend to forget about it, and just know that if you were to go into this Docs and Editors icon, it would open up a folder to show you other items that include the different editing tools we have, because really you can change anything in our program. But more importantly, since you are beginners, you probably need access to the software manuals. And so right here, you can see there's a subfolder for manuals. I'm not going to get into these editing tools. I consider that more of an intermediate or advanced topic. 
you are a beginner, you're just getting to know how to use our software and how to use our equipment for the first time for EEG. All right, so let's start with here. Here's the basics of the core equipment you have if you are that starter unit using the Procom 2 encoder. It's gonna consist of the white encoder box over here. Then we're gonna have a long fiber optic cable that links to this TTUSB box. From there, that TTUSB box plugs into this thicker cable, which then links into the computer via classic USB. I'd like to point out that uh, this fiber optic cable is usually 25 feet in length. It seems a little bit awkward, but some of our use cases involve people having the technology in one room and then having the computer in another. And so this thin cable allows you to kind of drill a hole through the wall and let it go quite a far distance. Be aware that you can make this cable much shorter. All you have to do is use a pair of scissors to chop it at a right angle, and then this can be a very short length of cable that links the Procom 2 white box to the TTUSB. For this fiber optic cable, please do not bend it at a right angle. Um, technically, it is a mirror inside the cable. That's how the light bounces. And so if you were to bend it, it cracks that mirror. And so that stops the signal from being sent. And that might cause issues where the system does not detect the equipment anymore. For those of you who are intermediate or expert system users, you have either the Procom 5, which only has five sensor inputs, or you have the Procom Infinity, which has eight inputs. The rest of the equipment is the same. You have the fiber optic cable that plugs into the side of the Procom 5 or Procom Infinity. That fiber optic cable then plugs into the TTUSB, and then the TTUSB links to this thicker cable, which then has the USB cable that goes into your computer. I'm gonna show you photos of what this looks like when it's plugged in now. So for those starter units, lower down here is the image of what the whole system looks like when it's plugged in together. So Procom 2, by this little crown or donut as I call it, links the um, fiber optic cable to the TTUSB, and then we have the thicker cable that goes to the computer. For this little crown or donut, you can actually twist it to loosen it, slide the fiber optic cable all the way in until you feel natural resistance, and then you can turn it once more to tighten it. Up here is an example of that. It's a little bit grainy, but still good. You'll notice that on the fiber optic cable, there might be a kind of a, a bluish line that indicates how deep you can go into. Just push the cable, uh, put the, push that cable in until it keeps going, and then when you feel resistance, it stops there. The TTUSB also has this crown or donut that you can twist to open up, put the fiber optic cable into, and then twist to close as well. Now, it goes to show that <laughs> this still uses a battery, so please don't forget to add the battery into it. We do provide it with the systems, but just know that some people try turning it on, and then they end up calling tech support for an hour trying to figure out why the system won't work, and lo and behold, they did not put the battery inside of it. The door slides open and close, and you can insert the battery in there. Please also take note that I might have you come back to this because there are some key codes associated with the activation of the equipment. And the key codes are typically hidden on the back side of the battery compartment door inside the battery compartment. So you just have to flip that over to see some key codes. Again, we'll talk about this more a little bit. If you have the Procom 5 or the Procom Infinity system, so you have that intermediate or expert users, same sort of setup in this lower image. We have the fire optic cable that links to that Procom unit using that donut or crown that you can twist open or close to loosen and tighten. And then it also attaches to the TTUSB with the same sort of crown. And then we have the thicker cable that links to the computer. Once more, at the upper right, we have those kind of grainy crown images or donut images where you twist to open and twist to close and then sort of fiber off the cable. You push it all the way in until you feel resistance. And then also know that you, this uses batteries. So you open that battery compartment, insert the batteries and close it. Once again, there are some hidden key codes that are on the back of the battery compartment door on the inside of it. And you'll need those as a reference point for activating the equipment once we get to the software stage. All right, let me give you an introduction to the actual EEG sensor before I put it on myself. So for this uh, training example, we're only going to focus on one channel of EEG, aka one sensor of EEG. Um, I'm going to focus on a monopolar referential montage. Uh, for those of you in your BCIA uh, training workshops, you should be able to recognize what that means. And if you don't, feel free to ask a question or refer to our software manual. Um, I'm going to be using an EEG Z sensor that links via a DIN cable and splits from one cable into three. And from those three cables, we're going to have electrodes on my head. Every single channel of EEG at minimum requires these three electrodes. Uh, sometimes we share electrodes with other EEG sensors because we want to have the same ground or references, but just know that at engineering origin, there's always three sites. For us, the blue plug or blue cable that goes in there is the active electrode that gets placed on the surface of the head for where we want to be able to measure EEG. 
Then we have the yellow reference electrode that sometimes goes on the ear, but also sometimes goes on the head. In our example, it's going to be going on an ear and acts as a reference where there's no brain activity in my earlobe as compared to the blue active electrode where there will be brain activity. And then we have the black ground electrode that almost always goes on the ear. Not the same as the reference, usually the opposite side. And I'll be showing that today. In general, you want the yellow reference for this uh, montage I'm doing to be on the earlobe that's closer to the blue active electrode. And you want the black ground electrode to be f on the earlobe that's further away from the blue active electrode. In the equipment that you receive, uh, that we call a monopolar bipolar electrode kit, you're going to have four different electrode cables. One should be a little blue cup for the active electrode that's blue. Uh, there should be a yellow reference as well as a, a yellow cup reference as well as a yellow ear clip reference and then a single black ear clip uh, ground. We're going to be using in this montage today the blue cup, the yellow earlobe, and the black earlobe. Now Again, I'm going to describe how you plug this stuff in together, and then I'm going to be showing you with the web camera in a moment. Right here, we can see I've isolated the three electrodes of interest. So there's that blue active electrode cup that's going to go on top of my head. There's the yellow reference ear clip going on one ear, and there's the black ground ear clip going on the other ear. I've lined it up with the DIN cable, that cable that splits from one into three, and we're going to insert them into little DIN cable plugs. Push it all the way in. It's very snug, and you'll hear kind of a when it's done uh, going as deep as can be. Uh, again, this is for a monopolar referential montage. Just looking for one EEG. Um, when plugging this equipment together, that DIN cable goes into the head of the EEG Z sensor. You'll notice that the orientation is like this, where it's coming inside. There's these little notches that should line up with little gaps on top of the sensors. It'll be obvious how that lines up. And then on the other end of the EEG sensor, there's typically a clip. This one's in metal, it's a little bit older. In this photo, it's in plastic, it's a little bit newer. You use that to clip to the individual's shirt or sweater or perhaps to um, a band around the chair behind them. We use this clip as a way of holding up the weight of the sensor and the electrodes. It's not all dangling loose. Please be aware that uh, orientation matters. So if we're reading the EEG Z sensor, we know coming out of the head is the electrodes that are going on the person. Coming out of the lower end is the cable that heads towards the encoder box. Right here is a picture of the Procom 2 encoders, that starter unit, and we can see how the other end of that sensor cable plugs into a certain input. In this example, it's going to go into input B, and that's what we're going to be using. You don't need to remember which inputs because the software also reminds you, but just for aware of those of you who are following along with what I'm doing today, we're going to be using input B. If you had the more advanced Procom 5 or Procom Infinity big blue encoders, we will be plugging the sensor into input C. All right, I'm going to show you, give you a visual of uh, how we're actually going to apply some electrodes to uh, my head and my ears. Um, I've actually created a much longer webinar on this process. If you want to check out Thought Technologies' YouTube channel, uh, it's called Getting a Good Impedance. You can just search that in YouTube and it'll bring up that. I go into a lot more details about everything you need. We're, I'm, we're doing the Cliff Notes version of it uh, right now, so it's a little bit faster. Alternatively, if you don't want to go to YouTube, you can just search uh, into Google, YouTube, Thought Technology, Good Impedance, and it brings up that particular webinar. So let's just get this out of the way, and let's have a look at me. Hello, hello again. All right, so I already actually have my equipment plugged in right here. It's all kind of sitting around. I have the cable, I have the TTUSB. Notice that my five out the cable is very short. I already chopped it to make it easier for my usage. And I also have my sensor. So I have my EEGZ sensor, and then I have the DIN cable with the three little uh, DINs that come from that single cable. Here's also the oop, the clip. So first off, I'm going to take this little clip, and I'm going to attach to my sweater right here, just so I know it's stored for good use, and I know where the cables are. Now, I'm doing this on myself uh, with a tiny, tiny little mirror that's right behind the computer. Um, typically, you're going to be doing this on another client. So I'm orienting this so that you see me. However, typically, we want to clip this on the back of the shirt or the sweater or on the back of the chair because we don't want this uh, in front of them. We don't want them distracting them. We don't want it in their vision. This is purely for your benefit. Now, I did not go ahead and plug the electrodes into this little DIN cable yet. I have them separate because I actually prefer applying these to the individual when they're just 
single little cables hanging around like this. I find that useful. Perhaps you will want to keep this all plugged in the entire time. That's really up to you, but I've given you the information of how you plug in together and what order of steps you follow is really up to you. Just know that when you go to recording time, it has to be plugged in, but how you get there is what you prefer. So to begin with the electrode application process, uh, you definitely want to find, follow hygiene rules according to your clinic or your practice or uh, the hospital network that you're part of. I'm going to be using my freshly washed hands when applying this, but you may be forced to use latex gloves. You may be forced to do um, alcohol swabs and things like that. You might be uh, instead forced to use a Q-tip to apply some of the paste we're going to be applying. That's really up to you. I've actually visited a lot of different clinics and they do this in a variety of different ways. Uh, this is my preferential method, but of course I'm doing it on myself right now, so that's okay. But you need to follow the hygiene rules that are stipulated by your institution as well as what sort of uh, professional you are. Now, first step of applying electrodes is that we've already decided where we want to put the electrodes. So I already know that with my monopolar referential montage, I'm going to be putting my yellow reference electrode here, my black ground electrode here, and I'm going to put in the blue active cup somewhere on top of my head. For learning purposes, I'm going to choose CZ, which is about halfway between both the tragus of my ears as well as halfway from the Indian little bony structure and nasin in the front. 50-50. Now on my big old head, it might look a little bit awkward and me applying it, I might not get it perfectly because I'm doing this in a mirror, but just know that typically you want to measure these structure sites and find that location quite well. Individuals who record uh, at CZ have the easiest of times because it's really just a halfway marker between both parts of the head. Um, I'm doing this quickly again, but you should put the full effort to finding the correct locations. If you're choosing something more like F3 and F4, that would be a little bit harder because you have to be sure exactly where the structures are and the measurement distances. I'm leaving those sort of measurements up to you and your BCIA training or current learning. I'm doing the fast version for your benefit. Now, once I know what active sites I want to look at, active sites, what sites in general I want to look at, we take out the new prep skin prep gel. This is a sandy paste um, that is meant to get rid of dead skin cells so we can get good electrode contact with what might be in the body. I right now applied a bit of the paste onto my finger and I'm applying pressure and rubbing to the ears. Uh, individuals often think that we want to um, use or apply gentle angel kisses to the individual. We don't want to hurt them. Uh, when applying electrodes. I very much do not like that idea. I want you to apply pressure. I want you to rub into the skin. We have to get away dead skin cells. Otherwise, we're not going to have good electrode contact at the impedance check stage, and you're going to redo this whole process. So please uh, apply pressure, push down. A clinician once made a joke that uh, they know they've done a good job of applying electrodes if the person is bleeding. And that, again, is a joke. But just know that it's not meant to be gentle and easygoing and nice little tap. No, no, we want to apply, rub a little bit. Uh, I suggest you try this on some guinea pigs, family members, children, friends who owe you favors, uh, just to see what works for you in terms of methodology. But typically, I find this is an art. Practice makes perfect. So I have a little piece of tissue paper. I'm going to wipe away the excess. And now I'm going to get the conductive paste. This is the sticky paste that conducts the electrical signal and helps the electrodes stick onto uh, the individual's head and ears. Um, what I'm going to do first is take the ear clips, because those are the easy ones. And again, you might be using uh, your gloves or Q-tip to get this paste out. I'm just getting out a globule by squeezing it onto my finger. There we go. And I'm applying some of that globule to the metal side of the ear clip. It's the metal that does the measurement of the data or the question of the data. The plastic side does not measure anything. We want to cover the metal such that it has a good layer. And now we're going to apply that ear clip to the site that I abraded with the previous gel. Please note, we want the paste side touching the side that I rubbed with the gel, not the opposite side of the ear. Otherwise, that is redundant. All right. Come on. There we go. We're going to find out if it did a good job a little bit later when we get to the impedance test. I'm going to take the black ground electrode meant for the other earlobe and repeat that process with a little metal. There we go. Excellent. And one electrode left. 
with the blue cup electrode that's going to go on top of my scalp. I don't need to use my finger to scoop it out first. I'll just use the cup itself as an ice cream scoop. How I describe this to individuals, how much paste we want. Again, it's like an ice cream scoop. I want some of that rounded ice cream sticking out the top. Now, the hardest part right here is that I need to correctly apply this where I prep the electrodes. So there's a high likelihood right now that I'm putting in the wrong location, and that's okay. We're just doing this to test things out. Now, when pushing the electrode down on the scalp, I don't actually want to put the, push the electrode really hard so that it's pressing against the skin itself. I want the paste to act like that meaty sandwich middle layer between the layers of bread. Bread being my skin and the metal of the electrode. It's holding the electrode there as well as conducting the signal. If I were to push really hard down on the metal so it's touching my skin, chances are the second I let go, it'll kind of push back and we'll have lower quality contact. All right, get rid of this excess gel. And now I have the EEG sensor right here with the three colored DIN cables, and I'm going to plug in the appropriate colored cables into them. So blue goes to blue. Nice little clip telling me I pushed it deep enough. Black to black. And yellow to yellow. Like I said earlier, normally all of these cables would be oriented to be coming off the back of my head because we don't want it interfering with my peripheral vision as me, the individual who's being assessed or training. But for your benefit, you're able to see this right now. All right. Now it is time for us to record some data. So let's get rid of this beautiful image and let's go look at some software. Uh, okay. So, okay. Now be sure to plug the equipment into the computer as well. Otherwise, that would be a silly step that we miss. Dun, dun, dun. All right. I've opened up Biograph Infinity and this is the main menu. Um, Almost all of the sessions we typically want to record with uh, the current software platform in a 360 suite is via the quick start button. You can actually record or initiate the recording of a session via start open display or start script session, but the quick start, as it suggests, is the fastest way of doing this. Quick start really has a lot of the settings that individuals would have to manage themselves already pre chosen, and it's meant to be. Uh, as quick and easy as possible. The settings we pre-chose for you are the ones that are most popular that clinicians want anyways, so there's not a lot of need to go to the other two ways of starting a session. Just know that uh, some classic users have been using our product for a long time might only go to the startup and display session because they're used to choosing the options and they like to have that control, or they want to choose a unique set of display screens for neurofeedback training, or they want to choose a certain scripted session but modify some settings, and that allows them to do that. But for our Intents and purposes today, just learning how to use the product. Let's go to Quick Start. So we open up Quick Start. In the left hand list, I have to list all my clients. It's currently in confidentiality mode, hence why we see all these little stars, asterisks that are hiding the client names. If you are using this for the first time, you're going to have to add a client name though. So add client. Um, and at minimum, you have to put here a first name and a last name. You don't have to put sex, you do not have to put birthday, and you don't have to put any of the other information. For this example, I am going to be, uh, well, you know, I am Celine Dion. I feel like I look a lot like her. And so I think it's just classic that I should put her into this system uh, as me. Um, if you are an individual who's using this recording and you're instead actually making use of our Z-Scores product, aka a neural guide, then you would have to insert the individual's birthday in here. Since Z-Scores is, is a normative database and it compares the individual's brain waves to a database of people of appropriate sex, age, and certain other conditions, it has to know the age of the individuals. For us, in where we're going with this recording today, we're not using Z-Scores, we're just using classic neural feedback, classic EEG assessments, so we do not compare back to a database of norms. If you want to learn more about Z-Scores, you can check out a recorded webinar that's on a Thought Technology website that we have over there, and I'll mention a little bit later at the end. I'm gonna hit OK, and this is gonna tell me that Celine Dion has been added. Here she is. And with our client selected, we're now gonna be able to go over to choose the session we want to record. Now, I have a lot of software in my system. I've been using Thought Technology for a long time, and also I developed the products. So I have many different suite names, but for us, what's of interest here is the 360 suite. That's the standard suite we are going to be using. And then from categories, we have a whole bunch of options. We have different sorts of assessments, some that focus on physiology sensors or heart rate sensors. We have BART, biofeedback, assisted relaxation therapy, 
a little bit more automated sessions using peripheral physiology. We also have self-regulation, aka neurofeedback or biofeedback, the actual feedback training component sessions. And then some Zucker game screens. Um, if you know those Zucker games, they tend to be most pro they're the most popular biofeedback or neurofeedback uh, games available in our field right now. For our interest today, we're going to choose the 360 Assessment P2 Procom 2. If you are a starter uh, system user using the white Procom 2 box, this is what you want to choose. If, however, you are one of the advanced users having a look at this, don't worry, I haven't forgotten about you. You are instead going to choose a little bit of a different option. For those advanced users, you are going to be selecting, oops, there we go. You're going to be selecting the 360 suite name, but instead for categories, it'll be a little bit different. If you're a Procom 5 user, you're going to be instead selecting the 360 Assessment 2 EEG. If you're a Procom Infinity user, you're instead going to be choosing the 360 Suite Assessment PI. They have slightly different settings between uh, different equipment pieces simply because when you re can record with more sensors, there's more possibilities and options. That's that. All right. So here, being a Procom 2 user, I've selected my category. And now for the actual favorite I'm choosing, it's CNS, Central Nervous System, 2 EEG Single Hertz Bins Assessment. This is a classic assessment that was popularized by Michael and Linda Thompson, uh, leaders in the field of neural feedback. Um, it really involves looking at uh, the entire frequency of EEG activity and breaking it down to single hertz bins. So single hertz being like a single bar that represents 2 hertz, and then 3 hertz, and then 4 hertz, all the way up to 30 something hertz. You get a full spectrum of brainwave activity. You notice in this favorite it says 2 EEG. So I could be recording using two EEG sensors. However, I'm choosing only to record with one EEG sensor today because again, this is a learning example. We're starting small before we go big. The software requires you to record data from at least one sensor, regardless of what sort of session it is. You don't have to use the maximum number of session, uh, sensors if you don't want to. Uh, my equipment's plugged in, the electrodes are on my head. I'm now gonna turn the equipment on. So I'm switching the on button on. There's a little green light that has appeared on my piece of equipment. So we are good to go. I'm now going to hit OK. The system's going to check to see if it can detect the equipment now. So it's going to think, 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 think. And here we are. First, it's asking for a serial number. This is for the Procom 2 equipment users. It asks for serial number. For the other more advanced users, it does not need to know the serial number. So the serial number is found on the underside of the uh, white Procom 2 box. For me, it says BK2220. I'm going to hit this little arrow button. It accepts it. I'm going to hit OK, and it's going to continue. Now we get to key codes. So this is the very first time I'm using this piece of equipment, this specific piece of equipment, on this computer. What it's doing is asking for key codes to unlock its functionality. This is a thought technology way of making sure people aren't stealing equipment uh, from us. And so you need to have key codes that are appropriate for this software and this piece of equipment. I told you earlier on when we were going over the plugging of equipment that uh, there's certain key codes hidden on the inside of the battery compartment on the back of the battery compartment door. That is the key code we are looking for right now. Um, some of you when you receive your product, in fact, also get it on a little sticker or a separate piece of paper, the key codes. Um, there'll be two key codes uh, listed as well as the serial number. The key codes are going to say ENC, so encoder key code, and as well as APP, application key code. Right now, it's asking me for the first encoder key codes. For me, on my specific piece of equipment, it's 84897065050. I'm going to hit the little arrow key, and it has accepted it. If you just tried to enter my code onto your system, it won't work. <laughs> I'm going to hit OK now. It's now going to ask for the second key code, the application key code. And so for me specifically, it's 688970200. Zero, Four. Hit OK, and it looks like it accepted it. Uh, for Procom 2 users, you always have this message come up saying that, oh, yes, this is the Procom 2 you're using. Some people use multiple different Procom 2s on the same computer. If you're at a neural feedback clinic that has a lot of our equipment, maybe you swap equipment with computers sometimes. So it always asks to confirm which Procom 2. For Procom Infinity or Procom 5 users, you don't have this issue. I'm going to OK to continue. And now it's going to bring us to uh, this initial window. Perfect. 
Those encoder key codes that we just entered only have to be entered the first time you are recording with this piece of equipment on this specific computer. They will never ask for those key codes ever again. If you were to install the software on another computer and use the same piece of equipment, it'll ask for those key codes again. But again, that's the first time on that new computer. We do not limit uh, how many times you can install our software and how many computers. You can do it as much as you want, but it always needs to have the key codes for each new computer entered at least once. Actually, not at least once, only once per computer. Now, we are at the stage where we want to verify the quality of electrode application I've done for my head. This is required for us to know how good EEG information is. If you were to just slap the electrodes on and hope they're recording good EEG, you are doing yourself and your client a disservice. There's a high chance that it's going to be poor quality data. So let's go ahead with the impedance check. To verify impedance, I'm going to head over to the hardware menu and go to impedance check. As a quick aside, notice there's also battery level. If ever you're unsure how much battery power is left in your battery, just choose that as well. So impedance check, I'm going to select impedance, and the system is now going to provide me instructions on how I perform the impedance check. It's slightly different for the starter users using the Program 2 equipment as compared to the intermediate or uh, expert users using the Program 5 or Program Infinity. So for my Program 2 little white box right now, it's telling me to trigger an impedance check, just unplug and replug the EEG sensor from the encoder. So you'd unplug that cable that's in the B input and plug it back in. Alternatively, because we found that users are too lazy to do this, they often just turn the unit off and then back on and it does the same sort of effect <laughs> to initiate an impedance check. Um, some users uh, have also a new cable, it's called the uh, sensor check cable, and it replaces the link between the white Procom 2 box and that little black sensor that I clipped onto my sweater. It has a little push button on it that you can click and then it just triggers the 10 seconds impedance check instead. Um, I'm going to do that right now. So I click that little button because I have that cable. And then, boom, it's letting me know what quality of contact I have for my electrodes. If you are a Procom 5 or Procom Infinity users, you don't have to do these push button things or pull in, pull out the sensors. All you have to do is go to the on button on your encoder boxes, hold it down for two to three seconds, and notice that the blue light will turn off, then turn back on, and it will start flashing continuously. When you see the flash, just let go. And as long as it's flashing, it's in the continuous impedance check mode. When an impedance check has been successfully performed, you're gonna see three numbers listed around different colored electrodes. Notice that this blue little drawing is meant to represent the blue active electrodes on my head. The yellow is representing the yellow reference electrode on my ears. And the black is representing the black electrode on my other ear. Um, in terms of values we're looking for, the lower these numbers are, the better contact you have with the skin for collecting real representative EEG information. As a standard, we want these numbers to be just below 10 and generally near each other, generally near being plus or minus you know, two. Um, if you're doing, if you're using this equipment for research purposes, I would suggest having these values at five or less. Right now, I have these values at two, one, and essentially one. This is absolutely great quality. I'm patting myself on the shoulder because I did this in a tiny mirror in front of a computer while talking to you all. I feel proud of myself. There's a high likelihood that you probably did not get an impedance as low as this. Yours might be in the 20s, 30s, 40s. If it says open, it means the quality of contact is so bad it's not even giving a number. Uh, what this means is that you in fact need to redo the electrode application process. So pull off the electrodes, wipe away that excess paste. Uh, alcohol wipes are great for getting rid of excess paste or warm water. And then redo the process where you take that skin prep gel, that sandy paste, the new prep, rub that skin surface once more, a little bit harder, and then redo the conductive sticky paste layer to stick the electrode back on. For our purposes right now, these are great numbers and it works really well. If you want to redo an impedance check, just know you have to re-click the little button uh, if you have the special cable or pull out the sensor plug back in or just turn it on and off uh, if you are a white Procom 2 user. If you are the Procom 5 or Procom Infinity users, it's just continuously taking an impedance check the entire time. To end the impedance check mode saying that oh you're done with this you have good impedance values and you're ready to get going with the recording all you have to do if you are a starter user using that procom 2 encoder box is wait the 10 seconds it automatically goes back into normal recording mode if you are the procom 5 or procom infinity users you in fact have to hold down the on button once more on the equipment box until the blue light stops flashing and it remains solid on and then let go and now it's back in normal recording mode 
you could generate a report from this if you just want to keep a copy of the impedance checks. Uh, some individuals who worry about uh, questioning whether they're collecting good quality EEG or not, aka avoiding lawsuits, might generate a report from this. Other people do not seem to care about that. It's up to you. I'm going to hit the close button right now. All right. So for this EEG assessment, the software is going to be running a scripted session. What this means is that the software already knows what it wants to do. It's essentially going to be bringing us, the clinician and the client, along for the ride. It'll be providing us instructions as it goes along and really knows what stats it wants. It knows what visuals it wants to show and it knows how long it's supposed to record for. The joys of assessments is that they tend to be repeated protocols where you can always do the exact same thing over and over again and the computer is doing the work for us. So I'm going to hit the little play button at the top here. Now the system is going to change and it's going to be giving some visuals right now. So currently, I know the system is not recording because again, I'm used to using this product, but it might be a little bit in front of everyone else. So what I'm showing right now on the screen is we can see two line graphs of raw EEG. Now, one represents real brainwave information and the other is just kind of this meandering signal because I'm in fact not using that sensor. For me right now, the B sensor right here represents the electrodes that are on top of my head. The A sensor, we're not using. It's just not real EEG brainwaves. I can tell because I'm used to reading this, but just know that it's still attempting to record something, it's just not understanding why, because the cables aren't plugged in. Similarly, there are two line graphs below here, and they're showing various amounts of information. One should be floating more towards zero, which represents that A sensor, where no data is plugged in. And then the lower one actually represents the B sensor, the one we're currently using. Sometimes you see a perfectly horizontal line, and that's because the system is also attempting to remove fake signals or bad quality data as we go along. Please take note that bad quality data represents really large EG brain waves that are real and also muscle movement. Notice how I'm talking to you right now. So there's a very high likelihood that I'm creating garbage data. And so it's attempting to clean some of that out and that's when we get these flat horizontal lines. You notice at the very far right, we also have some red lights that turn on and off sometimes depending on what's going on. And that system is also telling me, hey, stop blinking your eyes, stop clenching your jaw, Stop clenching your jaws, what I just said. And so it wants me just to stop all facial movement, really relax my face to get good, high quality EEG information. How about I stop talking for a moment so you get to see what good quality data looks like instead of just this garbled nonsense that comes with the fact that I'm moving my head, I'm moving my eyes, I'm moving my mouth. So that stuff was a little bit better. And we'll notice that, uh, you may have to go back in the recording for a moment, but um, good information that does not have extremely high amplitudes. Whereas right now when I'm talking, suddenly this raw EG has lots of blips jumping up high and low again, same thing down here. So just notice that once you get used to reading EG, you get a good idea of what it looks like. We also know there's some stereotypical waveforms associated with certain movements. So I'm gonna blink my eyes a bunch of time and notice how the data up here is gonna start jumping. Classic eye movement. Now I'm going to clench my jaw for a moment. So garbage data as well. And for a moment, I'm going to move my eyes from left to right. So these are stereotypical patterns associated with bad EEG data. Um, the muscles that wrap around my skull, that move my mouth, uh, that help move my eyes, are a lot closer and less insulated from the electrodes on my head than the neurons that are inside my brain protected by the skull, uh, dura matter, and other tissue. So that's why we want a person to relax their face and do as little movements as possible and little talking as possible in order to maximize what good quality of data we get. The best recordings are usually with individuals whose eyes are facing slightly downward and who are given something to rest their eyes on. Um, I say rest their eyes on instead of stare because stare sounds very intent like people start squinting and using more muscles. And so uh, provide an object, maybe place a dot on the table, something like that, but that's a, the way you can maximize what a good recording will uh, be generated from this. Now, all this data keeps going through the system. None of this is being saved. It's just kind of getting the data and throwing it out from moment to moment. I already know because of the structure of this assessment, this is our signal verification stage. At the lower right, it says signal verification. At the bottom, it says press A to Z or spacebar to continue. It's giving me a chance just to look at this screen, make sure the data quality is good, explain to the subject, aka Celine Dion, uh, how we want them to sit there to get good quality data before the actual activity begins. So 
This is an assessment that's based on eyes open. And so I'm going to do this eyes open task. There's going to be an eyes closed task a little bit afterwards. And then we'll be able to see a report from this. So I'm going to instruct my client, just relax. We want you to keep your face as calm as possible. I want you to just keep your eyes resting on that dot I gave you. And I'll let you know when we're done. It's going to be a short, brief recording. Now I'm going to hit the space bar to continue. Now I'm not actually going to be silent that long. That's far too difficult. I can't, I can't stay in silence. So I'm going to describe what we're looking at on this screen this whole time. We had this moment of brief good data though, so that's at least good. At the very bottom of the screen, you'll notice there's a green bar that's slowly growing. That's the progress marker. It's tracking, I believe, two minutes um, of eyes open data recording. So for this two minutes, we just want the client to sit there again, relaxed face, resting their eyes on the dots. As a technician or clinician who's monitoring a computer, we can make sure that we're just getting good quality data and we can remind them, hey, don't don't move, don't 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 shift, don't uh, don't do these things that might be generating bad quality data. Um, if you're assessing an individual who has attention difficulty or hyperactive, I've many times had the individuals start humming themselves because, you know, they're bored and they're waiting. Humming is still movement. It's, it's creating vibrations. It's, <laughs> it's the, the, Their muscles are activating for that. So you have to remind them not to hum. And you have to remind them not to talk. And if their eyes start looking around the room because they're no longer staring or resting their eyes on that point or dot or object, we remind them to just rest their eyes on it. The whole purpose of this is just making sure we get good quality data. At the far left, in this little dark blue area, we have some lights that appear when we know that there's a very large amount of artifacts being created. The lights don't always appear, but again, it's a system attempting to, to qualify, oh, this is good, this is bad, and it's ch catching the most glaring examples of bad data, but there is small examples of bad data that still get through. We can do artifact rejection uh, a little bit after this recording as well, so there's another stage of clean data, but just know that we still want to avoid it. These values that are changing from moment to moment are just showing us popular frequency amplitudes uh, as they are in that moment. They're not averages, they're just the moment to moment changes. They represent this middle graph for the A sensor that we're not using, and they represent this lower graph for the B sensor that we actually are using. Now at the bottom of the screen, the green bar is getting almost the way to be filled. Oh wait, there we go, I made a mistake, my apologies. It's not a three minute recording, it's, a, it's not a two minute recording, it's a three minute open eyes recording. My mistake. Once the green bar gets to the end, of this section, it will stop and will be provided with a new chance to uh, change activities or new chance to provide instructions to the client as they are waiting. If ever there's some reason why you want to pause the session temporarily because, I don't know, an electrode came off, the client is clearly not listening to us, someone walked in the room, you hit the little pause button up here, data will stop, and when you're ready to resume after, for whatever reason, you click the pause once more and then it resumes recording. If ever you want to stop the recording, you can hit the stop button right here. It'll give you a chance to um, completely restart the recording process going back to the beginning. Because this is a fixed protocol where the computer knows what it wants to record, it does not let you stop the system and save the data. It wants to go to completion. All right, so we got to the end of that three minutes. And although it looks like the data is still filling up, I know the system is no longer recording because at the bottom there's no green bar running and it says press the space bar to continue. At the upper left it says eyes closed baseline. So I know that we're now at the eyes closed baseline section. The reason we often have eyes open and eyes closed is because your brain reacts in different matters based on when your eyes are open and closed. Um, in your BCIA courses or workshops, you'll be going over the clinical implications of that and looking at that sort of data. But here, for technical purposes, we just know that we're now going to ask the client to close their eyes and that we'll continue the recording process. Um, for the eyes closed component, you'll notice that some frequencies might start going higher um, a little bit. And please note that just because someone's eyes are closed does not mean they avoid doing any kind of eye blinking or eye movement artifacts. Now, if they start moving their eyes left and right, even though all they see is darkness, their muscles are still at being activated and they can still generate some bad data. So I'm going to hit a space bar to continue and I'll have my eyes closed, at least for the beginning, before I interrupt it with my own voice and stream of thought. <laughs> All right, that was enough of that. And my eyes are now open and frequencies will have changed. 
Uh, in terms of this recording screen, everything still looks very much the same as it did before. It's just it's the different uh, activity step that is occurring. The system is automatically gathering these statistics and it'll be separating them according to the eyes open and eyes closed different conditions. And it's going to be generating this stuff into a report a little bit later that we are going to look at briefly. Um, when it comes to an assessment, it is honestly rather boring because you as a technician or a clinician are just making sure that you know, we're getting good data quality, but there's just nothing really to be done in the sense of the actual act of recording. The client needs to sit there and you just need to wait. And that is that. For those of you who have experience with a much larger and more expensive systems like a QEEG, you know that they often have to sit there for five to 10 minutes in perfect silence without generating artifacts. Far more difficult, far more boring. <laughs> yeah, um, there is no sound occurring in this particular software setting right now because I have it muted. If I go to the options menu and you see there's no check mark next to sound, that means that the sound coming from our software is muted. If I select sound once more, notice there's now a check mark. You should be able to hear some dings or cues when certain activities are complete. Um, and for feedback training, it is important to have the sound on because often, cl uh, often clinicians find that their clients are far more reactive to sound feedback. You know, when they're doing a good job, they get a certain noise, or certain music, when they do a bad job, they get a certain different noise or maybe no music. And so that seems to be very helpful for clients. Whereas uh, absolute science and just purely visual feedback is slightly less effective. So just be aware of that in terms of muting and things like that. Alternatively, if you ever find the sounds are annoying while listening to this recording and perhaps following along with your own software, then just feel free to mute the system. We do have a few other software options available. Graph mode, timescale mode. These just let you decide how much data is shown in these line graphs and how it's viewed from moment to moment. They're not key features, but if you like playing around with that, you can. All right, so we have about 30 seconds left in this recording and then we'll be complete and we'll be ready to save it. Uh, what are some other thoughts off the top of my head while we're doing this? Um, nothing right now. Um, the starting basis for these assessments, the, the, the single hertz bins, or I guess two EG hertz bins have used both EEG sensors. These are very good starting points if you do are just getting started in the field of neural feedback. Um, clinicians typically tend to look at CZ as a starting point because it is a central region where a lot of the processing information that an individual receives goes there before it goes to other parts of the head. Oftentimes, if you were to do normalization of uh, uh, EEG brainwave patterns at CZ, it tends to have a ripple effect at other parts of the head just because it has such an important function in terms of uh, behavior. The software here is now complete. Uh, it's assessment recording, and so it's giving us an option. Do we want to save or not save? Uh, we're going to choose save yes, otherwise we can't review the data, we can't generate a report. Save compressed is mostly an old feature where computers did not have unlimited uh, memory or, or space for storing sessions. If you were to save a session as compressed, you would have to decompress it before being able to review. So it's not really a valid option for most computers these days. I'm going to hit save. And the software already knows who I recorded this under and at what time. It's going to it, uh, stamp that automatically. For description, I think I'm going to put CZ, just to say that the active electrode site I was recording at was CZ. The software does not actually know that right now in this uh, standard uh, EEG amplitude uh, assessment. So I'm putting CZ as a note for us to remind, oh yeah, I assessed CZ. Perhaps I might want to re-record this, re this uh, assessment at one or two other sites. That is a possibility. And this just lets me know that CZ is it. Training codes are up to you. Notes, I could say, oh, someone interrupted the session halfway through, so disregard the eyes closed baseline, perhaps. These are additional notes you can include. Excuse me. I'm gonna hit okay. And the software's gonna ask, do I want to review the data right now? I actually do, but for the sake of learning how to review it at a later stage, I'm gonna choose no. The reason I'm gonna choose no is because if you are working with a client in front of you, chances are you don't want to review the data immediately with them sitting there. You instead want to take the electrodes off their head and start moving through another sort of assessment process or finishing the session with them. And then you're gonna to choose to review this data when they're not watching you. So you can come to whatever conclusions and feel more comfortable with that. As you get more experience with neural feedback in our software, you may wanna review the data immediately with them because you can instantly read the results. But I suspect you're probably not there yet. So we're gonna choose no. For replaying, replaying is more useful if you want to show them, hey, you did this really cool thing at a certain moment. We typically find that more useful for physiology centers like heart variability, breathing muscles, not so useful for EEG. 
So we're gonna hit no. The software's gonna say, hey, do you wanna record another assessment just like this again? I'm gonna say, no, I don't. And it's gonna remind me to turn off my encoder to save battery power. Also, because this might be the first time using the software with your computer, it's gonna ask, hey, the screens, this giant visual box was uh, automatically resized to fit your monitor. Do you want us to save this resizing? I'm gonna say yes. All right, we're now back at the main menu. So from here, I'm gonna show you how to review that session, artifact some data, generate the report, and then we're gonna jump on to some very basics of a neurofeedback training session. All data is saved in the database. So I'm click on that, and we can see the full list of all the clients I have here. Celine Dion is already selected because that was the most recent client, and we can see there's the two EEG single hertz bins assessment right here. It says two EEG just because of the name of the assessment. We only recorded one EEG, but again, it's using the name. We also have the description here. Oh, CZ. Oh yeah, there you go. I added that description. You can go to session notes if you added far more notes in there as well. For those of you who are wondering about this confidentiality mode with all these little stars asterisks that I mentioned, you can turn this on or off by going to the settings menu and choosing confidentiality mode right there. So that's an option for you. All right, I want to review this session. So I'm going to choose Celine Dion. I'm going to choose a session right here and I'm going to hit the review slash report button. Well, then what is going to pop up confirming what review screens we're using. It's all automated. It already chose that for us. So I'm just hit OK to continue. So here we are. We are at the review screen. All the graphs here on the slightly left side are for the sensor we were not using. That's why the data looks so garbage. And the data looks slightly more believable on the right side because it's actually coming from my brain. Now. This is showing us 10 seconds worth of data. And up here at the top of the screen, there's a little left-right scroll that we can use to move forward in time if we want to. Now, some people do like to manually artifact data. If you're a researcher, you might be prone to want to manually artifact each of the research assessment sessions because that is just the standard. Uh, you could do that by finding the bad quality EEG information in the raw brainwaves line graph and then marking it as an artifact. How do we mark that? We hold the control key, left mouse click, and holding those two, we drag over the section of bad data. Now, technically, all the data we're looking at is bad because I was talking the whole time and moving my eyes. But uh, as an example, I'm saying this, I tell the system that, hey, between about 50 seconds there and almost 55 seconds, you're no longer including this in statistical analysis because this is bad quality information. If ever we've marked an area uh, as bad quality data, but it's actually good. We can always undo this by right-clicking and choosing Undo Rejection Segment. And now it goes back to being included in statistical analysis. Note that when you remove data from this raw EEG line graph, it removes all of the EEG statistics that come, I guess, downriver we can call from it. And so uh, any statistic from any frequency is now removed if it comes to that timestamp. Most of you users, however, will not be doing this manual EEG artifacting. You're going to use the automatic EEG artifacting tool because it's faster <laughs> and it's very good at getting data. So I'm still moving forward, looking at all this information that's generally poor quality. And I do believe there was a moment where I gave you some respite when I stopped talking. Let's just look for that. All right, here we go. This is, yeah, this is a little bit better information. Notice how the amplitudes are suddenly not as, as high, don't go as high or, or as low. In general, I found that uh, the vast majority of good EEG information exists somewhere up to, and not that much higher than 18 to 23 microvolts. When I say microvolts, I mean this vertical scale right here. So 18 to 20 microvolts up here, or I guess also minus 18 to minus 23 microvolts down there. When we use the automatic EEG artifacting system, it will be looking at this raw EEG and it uses very high or very low amplitude EEGs as, as the basis of what is good or bad EEG information. So to do that automatic EEG artifact rejection, I'm going to go to the oops, there, tools menu, select review mode auto rejection settings. This window will pop up and in here we tell the system, hey, what do we want to use as our threshold or basis for EEG data rejection? I'm going to choose the B sensor because that's the one we used. We did not use an A sensor. And in rejection threshold at the bottom, I'm going to put a value of 21. What does 21 mean? It means any value that's higher than 21 microvolts. So looking at this graph over here, higher than 20 microvolts, I'm assuming is going to be considered bad data because what generates high amplitude raw EEG signals 
eye blinks, jaw clenches, movement of the mouth because the, the, the jaw muscles are helping the person talk. That is bad data signal. So I'm telling it if the value of a signal ever goes above 21 microvolts, aka 22, 23 microvolts, or if it goes below minus 21 microvolts, minus 22, minus 23, then flag that EEG information as not real information and ignore it for statistical analysis. So I'm gonna hit the set button right there. It now knows 21 set. Conditioned bipolar, ignore the word bipolar. It doesn't have to do with a bipolar uh, setup nor with someone with that um, mental condition. I'm gonna hit okay. And now the system is gonna analyze that data and it'll flag every single section that is of an amplitude that is above 21 microvolts or below minus 21 microvolts. Now, once it's done adding these little gray markers into all of the raw EG information, it will let me interact with the screen. Do, do, do. It's still thinking because there's a, la a lot of bad quality data simply because I was talking for the vast majority of this entire session. Now it's just reanalyzing statistics according to the new criteria where bad data is not included in statistical analysis. And if I were to move forward and back in time, we can see how most of the recording is now in gray simply because I am talking the entire time. It's very hard to get good data when someone's talking or opening their eyes. And then there's a little section where I was able to briefly shut up and the data gets a little bit better. And then it goes back to being bad. <laughs> if ever you want to double check um, how much data was rejected, you can go to this little calculator-like icon and choose calculate statistics for the whole session. It already calculated them, but in this window towards the lower right, you'll see the rejection durations. So for the eyes open condition, it rejected 76% of the data. And for the eyes closed condition, it rejected 72% of the data, which is a lot of data. If Celine Dion, the client, were diligently sitting still, not singing, um, she would have uh, produced far fewer artifacts and would have had far less data rejected. For an average client, I assume I'm gonna reject at least 10% of the data because out of every 10 seconds, I'm assuming they're gonna blink at least once, which is one second. That's a standard assumption I make. If this were to be a child with ADHD, then I'm probably gonna reject 20, 30% more data because they have trouble sitting still and you have to kind of cue them, remind them several times. Uh, the percent of data you reject is really dependent on how well they are able to sit still. But again, I make an assumption I am rejecting at least 10% of data. If it suddenly says only 5% of the data is rejected, I'm actually gonna to wanna to go back and change my rejection threshold, or my, my definition of what is good or bad EG, and I'm gonna lower that value down. Why would we have to change the threshold? The reality is that different people's heads have different you know, protective layers, uh, protect, uh, protective layers uh, between the electrodes on top of their scalp and the um, brain waves or neurons inside of their head. Um, some people have more insulation, therefore we're gonna get naturally weaker uh, microvolt electro, uh, electrode signals, and some people have less insulation, and so they have higher amplitudes. This is just a, a reality of what it's like, but I've told you before, somewhere between 18 and 23 microvolts seems to be this generally uh, normal threshold level for most people. Uh, th the Thompsons have noted quite a few people who have very low amplitude profiles. Nothing wrong with the equipment, but there's just some people who will get like that. And by low amplitude profiles, hitting 10 microvolts would be astonishing for them, just because that's uh, how we can measure the uh, EEG from coming out top of their head. It is what it is. Uh, if I wanted to redo this rejection, I would simply go back to Tools, Review Mode, auto reject Settings. I'd reselect that sensor, and instead of 21, I might change it to, let's say, 19, and Set. When I hit OK, it's gonna ask, oh, do you want us to delete the previous rejection sentiment, so undo what it did before? And if I say yes, I want it to undo what it did before and then apply the new rejection, or no, I want to just apply this, this rejection on top of the previous one. Uh, as an example, some people like to even mix manual artifact rejection with automatic, in which case you would do the manual, if you did the manual rejection first, it would know to kind of reapply with this. I far suggest people to do the automatic rejection first and then manual afterwards though. I'm gonna hit yes to say it's gonna undo the previous work and then reapply this new rejection settings. And it's just gonna reject more data because I'm making the threshold lower so it's harder for good information to be uh, quantified or qualify for this setting. System is gonna think, 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 think. There we 
we go. We're going to go back to calculate statistics and we're going to see, look, now I have rejection durations that are 82 or 80%. So I've rejected more data back from the 70 something before. Let's pretend this is good EEG information at this point. This is not. If you're rejecting 80% of a session, it really just means go back and have them redo the assessment, have them sit still, blink less, because that's a lot of data that's rejected. Essentially rejected almost two minutes and 30 seconds of a three minute activities each. So it's not a lot of data to use as assessment. Um, so, but pretending we're good, we're gonna now generate the special Excel report that's associated with this uh, one hertz bin session. So I'm gonna go to the printer-like icons called session report. I'm gonna go generate Excel report. Note, you need to have Microsoft Excel for this to work. So it's generating an Excel report. It's now sending the statistics there and the Excel report is graphing them into a convenient manner that we decided. And here we have the Excel report. So we have our client name, Celine Dion, both asterisks. Right down here, we can select what EEG site we used as a reminder to us, CZ. And we have the time of day, session, uh, date as well, and then the EEG information. So please know that sensor A is a sensor we did not use, so this is to be ignored, and sensor B is the actual sensor we used. Oops, sorry, all those pages, sensor A, so yeah, just keep ignoring this. Zoom past sensor A, blah, 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 not useful. There you go, sensor B, real EEG information. Now, this is a one hertz bins, so each bar represents a single hertz. So this first one is representing two hertz to three. The second one is three to four hertz, aka it's really 3.0 to 3.9 hertz. That's what it means by three hertz. And then four, five, six, seven, all the way up to 44. In general, there's an inverse relationship uh, for eyes open between amplitude and frequency. This means that the lower frequency has a very high amplitude, and as we go to a higher frequency, that amplitude typically goes downward. Now, the results here are not exactly very representative. Again, I was talking the whole time. It's almost all artifact and stuff like that, but this is just an example of what the report could look like. The first activity says eyes open, and the second activity says eyes closed. Further down, we have the standard bandwidth frequencies, delta, theta, alpha, SMR, beta, etc., for eyes open, eyes closed, and then we have some popular ratios also included. Please note that the theta, theta squared over beta squared uh, is the attention index. It's that popular ratio used for evaluating uh, ADD in individuals. And so you can actually look at the research paper that gives you norms according to age groups for children as well as some younger adults. You can include notes in the little notes page down here if you wanted to. And if you like, you can then save this Excel report as an actual file so you don't have to regenerate it. Or you can print it out. It's up to you. Now, like I said at the beginning of this recording, we do not go into clinical interpretation. This is purely for technical use and getting you ahead with our equipment and software. So for clinical interpretation, please refer back to your mentor or the course that you are attending. I'm going to close this report. I don't need to personally save this as much as I do love looking at fake Celine Dion's data. And I'm going to choose to quit out to go back to the main menu, and I'm going to do a brief stop over looking at some neural feedback training. This session and the artifact rejections, these gray sections marked, will be saved by the software. So we'll remember these markings if I ever review this section, uh, review this session at a later time. All right, we're back at this main menu and we're gonna do a brief stop over uh, looking at neural feedback training. Um, there's a lot of different ways of doing neural feedback training. It depends on how many EGs you wanna look at as well as what sort of feedback you wanna examine. In our 360 suite package, we give you some standard preferential training screens and ways of looking at the data and doing training. Uh, I'm gonna show you a few of them very briefly, give you an idea of the controls, and then from there, you're gonna be able to make a choice of what you think is best for you and your clients. We're gonna go back to the quick start, and for the category, we're instead gonna be choosing 360 self-regulation. This is for the Procom 2 encoder. For the Procom 5 or Procom Infinity, you're gonna be using self-regulation, but it's gonna be a slightly different one. CNS, again, represents the central nervous system, and for us, we're gonna go with standard bands training. Make sure your equipment is turned on, and make sure the electrodes are still in the person's head, and we're gonna click OK to continue. It's gonna verify that I can detect the equipment, and you'll notice that the system is not going to ask for any key codes this time. We'll simply move past that because we only have to do that the very first time. Now it's telling me that, hey, it's not gonna be including sensor A 
if I'm using sensor A in this session because the session does not expect it, and that's fine. I'm not using sensor A, so yes, I would like to continue. All right, now, unlike the scripted protocol that was the one hertz bins assessment we did earlier, this type of session is called an open display session. It does not know how long we want to, to record for. Um, it does not know necessarily what the task is. It's just giving us free flow control as the therapist or the clinician who's monitoring this. And we're the ones who are deciding what's gonna be going on. There's a few different visual displays we can choose from in this session where it provides a variety of options. In this first one, it's really focusing on alpha amplitude training if we want to do that, and specifically for eyes closed. If we were to jump over to screen number two, it's looking at alpha peak frequency, which is a different type of statistic. They're both alpha, but slightly different. Uh, we can go screen three, which is alpha theta training. This is often people attempting to do relaxation, uh, again, with eyes closed. And then we jump to four. We have some training with going to be different bandwidths and a certain animation video. And then screen number five is very similar to that. I'm going to choose to start with this particular training screen because the most standard and popular format for neurofeedback training is with three bands. That's to say there's going to be three individual bar graphs that are each training their own unique condition. And so we're looking at a single EEG site, but we're training three different bandwidths. In this example, it's going to be theta, 48 hertz, SMR, 12 to 15 hertz, and high beta, 21 to 35 hertz. If I want, I can just hit play right now to make some data run from the system, just to give us an idea. But there's not going to be any feedback for a particular reason. We'll get to there in a moment. Just getting you used to what this looks like. Notice how there's three color-coded vertical bar graphs. And again, they're color codes, so you know that this first red one is theta, the second is SMR, and the third is high beta. On the far left, there's going to be a raw EEG signal. It's just letting us know what the raw EEG looks like. In some clinicians, use as a reference point of how clean the data is. In order to stop talking, you'll notice that the amplitude is going to be far less high. So that's much more real in terms of EEG information. Back to these central bar graphs, you'll notice that for the first 30 seconds of the session, these threshold markers were not moving and they're just kind of sticking around. Our software has a feature where after 30 seconds, automatic uh, thresholding will kick in where the software will move the, each individual threshold bar to maintain a percentage success that's at 80%. What this means is that 80% of the time, the amplitude of a particular bar graph is gonna be on one side of uh, a threshold and then the other 20% of the time will be on the other side of the threshold. In general, research has shown that when it comes to learning a neural feedback task, it's somewhere between 70 and 80% success rate per minor condition, uh, allows for the person to do the fastest amount of learning or learning what that task is. So currently, if we focus on this red bar graph, the threshold keeps moving because the software is attempting to place the threshold such that 80% of the time my theta is below the threshold and the other 20% of the time it's above. The training goal here is actually to bring theta amplitude down. So we want this bar to be as low as possible, and that threshold is moving us to this nice, happy initial training point for us to use. For the green graph in the middle, we're actually trying to reward or increase that amplitude compared to the previous one we we're trying to um, decrease it or inhibit. So here we want the signal to be 80% above the threshold and 20% of the time below the threshold. For the blue one, high beta, it's similar to theta where we want it 80% of the time below the threshold and 20% of the time above. You can see above each of the individual bar graphs, we have a certain percentage, and that percentage is constantly changing because the system is always remeasuring how long the signal is above or below each individual thresholds. The value below each percent value is what the threshold is currently sitting at as well. What I've just said is a lot of information that can be a little bit complicated, but I am going quick, and we're just trying to give you an introduction to how this works. Think about thresholds like this. When you initially put the electrodes on someone, you want to start training certain frequencies. How do we decide what threshold is a good starting point for them learning how to get that amplitude to be higher or lower? Placing that threshold or value that provides 80% or 70% success rate is the best position. So that's why this automatic uh, moving threshold is very good for setting up a session initially. Now it is actually possible to have these thresholds not automatically set up. If I were to right click on the central bar graph here, then those threshold mode, automatic. If I set it to manual, the software will stop moving the threshold and suddenly the threshold remains fixed and we're only gonna see how well I'm doing based on this percentage changing. So let's say I had a hard time initially trying to do this task 
And so the threshold is constantly moving to maintain the 80% success rate. If we set the threshold to manual, it'll stop moving and we'll be able to see if I'm actually getting the task, if I'm successfully getting my signal to be above the threshold, higher than 80%, 85%, 90%, or if I have no idea what I'm doing and it just starts falling to 65, 60%. So clearly I'm just, I'm not aware of what's going on. You can use the software in our system to set the thresholds for you to make it easier for you. And then you can set each individual bar graph to manual threshold. So it's a fixed training point, but it's not automatically trying to help me and lets me kind of learn to swim on my own. If I were to stop talking, you're gonna notice these thresholds are gonna be lowered right now because all this talking and eye blinking is making the thresholds be moved to really high values just because a lot of the fake signals produce higher amplitudes. So let's see that for a moment. All right, now I'm gonna pause the session for a moment. Right here on the side, we have theta, SMR, high beta, and we have their cutoffs. If we wanted to train different cutoffs, we could always right click on them and change them to different values. So instead of being theta four to eight, maybe we want theta four to seven. I can put a value of seven in there, apply, close, and now theta represents four to seven hertz. You can do this to any of these little frequency instruments. We're gonna see some other screens where you're actually meant to enter your own frequency instead of being fit with these standard frequencies. I'm just letting you know that you can change this. Now let's talk about actual feedback. Right here we can see there's general, smaller, minor forms of feedback. When the amplitude is on the correct side of the threshold, in which case for theta we want it to be below the threshold, for high beta we want it below the threshold, and for SMR we want it above the threshold, you notice that the color becomes a deeper, stronger color. When the amplitude or the signal is on the wrong side of the threshold, it turns to be gray-like. I'm gonna unpause the session for a moment to see that. Notice that it turns gray when it's on the wrong side. Those are some simple cues of, hey, what direction we want it to go on for each individual signal. There is, however, a much grander feedback, and that is this animation right here. Thus far, the animation has remained black because I didn't turn on the animation. I didn't set it to a certain video yet, but I'm gonna do that in a moment. Usually we use these animations as big qualifiers for feedback, and so, um, in this example, it's a video that's streaming from online or somewhere else on my computer, and it's showing a large picture that runs uh, as large as possible when I'm doing well, and then it starts shrinking when I'm doing worse. So the idea is I want the picture to be as large as possible where I get to see it really well, and if it starts going really, really small, it means I'm not doing a good job. There's other types of feedback where it can be very much on-off. It plays, it pauses, it plays again. Um, it can be louder or softer music as well. There's a variety of things in the system, and you can explore each screen for what it is. Let me stop the session for a moment. If I wanna, when I stop the session, I get the averages for the EEG values um, as they were for this previous recording period. I'm gonna hit close because I don't care about the statistics right now. I do not wanna save the session. And do I want to record another session with the same configuration? Yes. So it's gonna reload and now I can automatically start a new recording session on the same screen. So right here, I have this video where I'm gonna right click, edit video selection, what video do I wanna run with? Here, we're gonna choose Pixar. Just so you know, Pixar, the very popular animation company that makes many movies that you love as a child or as an adult or possibly your family loves, uh, uploads their shorts for free onto YouTube. So what I'm doing is I'm actually gonna stream one of their Pixar shorts. Select it there, add it to the playlist. You can put multiple videos here and hit okay. Now it's gonna be reaching out for that video in the internet. It's gonna stream it live. Alternatively, I could download movies and I could have the system grab that movie from somewhere else on my computer. So you don't have to use the content we, uh, we supply with you of these options. Let's hit play. The system is gonna, once again, take 30 seconds before it starts moving these thresholds. And now suddenly we have this animation running. If the task is being done poorly, the picture remains small. If we're doing well, the picture starts growing. I'm gonna stop talking for a moment to see if I can get to do this a good job. I'm a bit distracted, I'm not doing a very good job. Oh well, it is what it is. Now, um, this is the core of what a neurofeedback session is like. Um, they use some sort of feedback to know when they're doing a good job, and you, the clinician, set up the screen to be appropriate training difficulties for that individual. 
If you want to make it harder, you can always move a threshold to be higher if you're attempting to get the value of the signal to be above the threshold or lower if you want to be the signal value below that threshold. Um, other things on this screen that are redundant from any other screens, at the very bottom we have a periodic mean. So every 20 seconds it shows us what the average amplitude was for each frequency for that previous 20 seconds. So typically during a training session, if someone is doing well, these lines will be quite horizontal and flat because they're remaining in that state continuously. If there's a lot of up and down, it means that they're kind of coming in and out of that state, or there's a lot of artifacts being introduced in the system, so they're not really paying attention. Just be aware of that. It gives you an idea of whether they're consistently in, in whatever state that is, or if they're not doing a very good job. Like with the assessment, we still want the person to avoid blinging their eyes a lot and clenching their jaw. So we have them doing the training in silence. And I mean, they can't avoid blinking completely, but we just don't want them looking around the room or shaking their head. Typically, when it comes to training, you only do three to four, maybe five minute spurts. So you train for three to four, five minutes, then you pause, take a break for a minute, and then train some more, pause, take a break a minute, train some more. You can track statistics across these multiple little training periods to see how they did that day. And then you can also compare those statistics to future sessions, or um, you can compare them to the initial assessment, all the assessments kind of different because they're sitting there doing nothing intentionally. So it's hard to compare a training session to an assessment session. You typically compare assessment to assessment session. So initial assessment and then after 20 sessions, assessment once more. Um, every time you want to stop the session because you're taking a break, you know, hit the pause, pause button and then it'll wait. Or you hit the stop button and so you can have multiple little three to five minute sessions saved. It's up to you. Different clinicians do this in different ways. Um, I actually have another webinar where how do you um, order or structure a neural feedback session aren't recorded. That's also on the Thought Technology website. Um, it's a webinar for free, and I'll reference a link to that at the end of the session. If ever I wanted to jump between screens in the middle of us recording, I can always just jump to screens by hitting on these other buttons right here. If, for example, we were doing simple training where it just involves a single bar graph like here, I can jump here, pause, and here we are. There's a different sort of feedback going on here because the person's eyes are closed. It might be very loud right now, but there's a difference between a river sound and an ocean sound. With someone's eyes closed, the whole purpose is to uh, produce, I believe it's the, um, the, the ocean sound. I'm going to stop this session because I want us briefly, very, very quickly, looking at a different quick start of sessions. Here are the statistics when I hit the stop button. These were the whole session averages. And so if you're doing the pause type of training where you record for three minutes, pause, unpause, record for three minutes, pause, unpause, record for three minutes, and you hit stop, this is for all of those different sessions, uh, regardless of the pause or not. If you did the training style where you're just stopping the session, saving, and then choosing to record another set, new session with the same configuration, this would be only for that single session. So there's different ways of looking at statistics, and I personally prefer doing the full stop and then initiating a new session to get stats that are you know very focused on just that brief recording period, but different people have different ways of running. I'm gonna choose not to save this. No, I wanna choose a different configuration, so it's gonna send us back to the main menu. Now, I'm gonna go back to quick start, and this time I'm gonna choose user defined bands. This is gonna check equipment once more. Now, something I didn't state before when we got to the neurofeedback training, I did not do my impedance check. That's because I just did impedance check when we ran the assessment. But most likely for you, you're going to have a client come in and they're not going to do an assessment and straight to neurofeedback all in the same 55 minutes. No. You're going to have them do the assessment and then they'll come back at a later stage to start with training. When they get into the clinic for training and you put the electrodes on their head, you once more have to do impedance check. Every time you remove the electrodes from someone's head and you put it on their head once more or a new head, you need to redo that impedance check. Impedance check is the exact same thing. You go to the hardware menu and choose impedance check as you would. But just know that if the electrodes stay on the person's head for some reason, there's no need to redo impedance checks unless you literally see them pull out the electrodes. All right, so here's a different type of quick start. This is standard bands. You notice we use a lot more animations that are stuck here. You also notice that instead of saying theta, alpha, beta, or something like that, it just says band one. And so we don't know what band one is, except that it says right here in the uh, definition that it's four to eight hertz. In case you wanted, this is low cutoff frequency, high cutoff frequency. So let's say I did not want to train this one band of four to eight hertz. I want to train, let's say, eight to 12. I can do that right now. Oops, there we go. Yeah, something I've noticed in our system. 
you can't have the numbers go higher or lower. So it was at eight, so it switched to 7.9. So I had to change the other one first. Apply, close, there we go. Now we're training eight to 12 Hertz, AKA alpha. You'll see these little gray setting instrument boxes for these frequencies all over the EEG screens. Just know that you have to set them before you start training. You can change in the middle of training, but there's no real purpose to doing that. Right now, the goal here is we want this amplitude to remain above the threshold. And then we get the animation to play and the music to be heard. I'm going to change the threshold to manual mode for a moment. And I can now manually move the threshold by clicking on it and dragging it up and down. Suddenly, when the signal is now below the threshold, the animation stops and the music is far softer and cannot be heard as loudly. Again, different ways of showing feedback. Jump over to screen number two. Very similar setup, but now there's two bar graphs. Still an animation right there. Three. Now we have three bar graphs, same sort of thing. Again, you have to set the frequency definition for each one. This would be another streaming video. And there we go. This last feedback example is one where instead it's a puzzle. As the individual holds the condition, aka has each of the amplitudes correctly above or below the thresholds, puzzle pieces get added in. The goal is that you want to see how many of these puzzles the individual can fill in over a set period of time. Right now hearing lots of beeping because it's noticing there's a lot of artifact and it wants me to stop generating artifact, but I'm talking, so a little bit impossible. Here, I'll stop speaking for a moment. Oh, actually, sorry, I got that wrong. It's um, letting us know when you're adding a puzzle piece in. My mistake. So let's jump out of this one. Let's say I wanted to change one of the animations. It always has to be done before we hit the recording button. But you right click on the animation screen, edit instrument settings, and boom, there you go. You have a bunch of different animations to choose from. You can use this little scroller to see how the animation changes with time as well. Let's say you wanted to change the music. Edit instrument sound, settings, and currently it's using this particular song. You can enter in your own music into the system uh, as long as it's uh, an MP3 format. And so you could be using your own Celine Dion music to train Celine Dion, eh? or heavy death metal or blues, stuff like that. It's, it's really up to you. Just please note that where you place these files is by going to that yellow Biograph Infinity Docs and Editors icon, going into Biograph Infinity Data Folder, and then place your music into Sounds right here. And then it'll be selectable by the system. Now, I've gone over the core features of this software for you getting started with assessment and with neural feedback. Um, there's a lot of other things I have not mentioned, but really this is what's needed for someone just getting going. Um, as always, uh, Thought Technology has our 9to5 technical support team available for people with technical questions. If you purchase their equipment from a dealer, they are also available to you to aid in this instruction. And so you can reach out to them or us, and we're always available to help you guys as you move along. As I stated before, there is a software manual, so you can go and use that because that definitely provides a lot more detail and also provides very specific instructions for each screen or each type of assessment. I did a very quick and dirty, I guess we can call it, version of that. Now, if you want to go for some additional online free learning, we do have webinars that we've already recorded available on the Thought Technology website. If you go to this, this little section right here, uh, you'll note that there's a section for new webinars, ones that will be running live with uh, live attendees, and you can join that too. But there's also a past webinars section, if you were to click on the far left side. Some webinars I suggest, if you're interested in that, uh, would be neurofeedback tips for structuring an EEG session. I did mention that. I talk about exactly how we structure a session, how we track statistics. Uh, for those of you who are interested in heart rate variability, uh, there's a webinar for adding HRV into your practice. That's also provided by me. And then my colleague, uh, Frank, uh, gave a webinar on remote neural feedback and biofeedback practice for those who might be lending or using the equipment at a distance with your clients. At this time, I believe I've gone over everything necessary for getting going with this uh, equipment set, whether it's a starter system, intermediate, or expert. Uh, I'd like to thank you all who got to the end of this webinar. And uh, if ever you want to reach out to me, you feel free to do that. My email is here below. I'm happy to answer questions as available. We also provide um, 
private online instruction if you are looking for that. Uh, so again, welcome to the neurofeedback field, and I hope you have a wonderful time on this journey. There's so much to learn, and there's a lot of enjoyable things to figure out. All right, thanks. Bye-bye.